Hello, everybody. I'm Jonah Ruse, curator in charge of the Department of Ancient Near Eastern Art, and I would like to welcome you to a very special event sponsored by the Metropolitan Museum and the American Institute of Iranian Studies. Uh, this is a nonprofit consortium of American universities and museums that has as its core mission uh, to provide grants and programs that provide uh, both scholarship and expose new generations of students and the general public to the art and culture of the wider ancient Iranian world. The Institute, spearheaded by its very active executive director, Dr. Erica Ehrenberg, who is here today, and I always have to thank her for her support. She's over there. Um, she is a herself an ancient Near Eastern scholar who's worked in our own department and has recently been working together with us to create a variety of programs to highlight the art and culture of Iran which has particular relevance at this time as we prepare to present the exhibition, The Cyrus Cylinder and Ancient Persia, which opens next June in the Metropolitan Museum, and I hope you'll all come to our galleries to see that show. Uh, this past September, thanks to uh, the AIIRS, we were able to host a lecture by Elizabeth Carter at UCLA on the Royal Women of Elam that many of you attended. And today, it is my pleasure to welcome you again to explore another aspect of the art and culture of ancient Iran in a lecture by Dr. Mark Garrison. Mark holds the Alice Pratt Brown Distinguished Professorship in Art History in the Department of Art, History, and Art and Art History at Trinity University in San Antonio, uh, Texas. His primary research interests are the glyptic arts of ancient Iran and Iraq in the first half of the first millennium BC. He specializes in the glyptic preserved on two large archives from Persepolis, the Persepolis uh, Fortification Ar Archive and the Persepolis Treasury Archive. With Margaret Coolroot, another good colleague of ours, he is author of Seals on the Persepolis Fortification Tablets Images of Heroic Encounter, published by the Oriental Institute in Chicago. In addition to this documentary work uh, presented in that volume, his research has focused on social aspects of glyptic production in workshops in Persepolis, especially issues surrounding the impact of individuals of high status and or administrative rank on the development of style and iconography in the early Achaemenid period. His publications have also addressed the emergence and development of royal e ideology in the, on the seals and ceilings of uh, Persepolis, religious imagery in Achaemenid art, and the relationship of glyptic of the Achaemenid period with earlier seal traditions in Elam and Mesopotamia. I'll just list a few of his uh, numerous articles, which are many, many pages long, um, with these titles, The Royal Achaemenid Iconography, The Figure in the Wing Disc in Persepolis Glyptic, uh, The Royal Name Seals of Darius I, By the Favor of Ahura Mazda, Kingship and the Divine and in the Early Achaemenid Period, uh, and also royal uh, and visu visual representation of the divine and the numinous in early Achaemenid Iran, old problems, new directions. So you get the idea a little bit about the nature of his research. Dr. Garrison's most recent book is The Ritual Landscape at Persepolis, the Glyptic Imagery from the Persepolis Fortification and Treasury Archives, which is a publication of his lectures as visiting professor at the College de France in Paris. Um, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Garrison to the Metropolitan, and I especially, being a scholar of seals and ceilings, I'm very much looking forward to your talk. I want to also mention that tomorrow at 11 in the morning, he will be offering his views on imperial culture in the Achaemenid world in a talk in our permanent galleries. For those interested, please meet at 11 a.m. in the Velez Blanco patio, which is gallery number 534 for those of you that can read our, 
our plan of the galleries. This evening, he will speak to us about temples, towers, altars, and fire worship, the ritual landscape at Persepolis. So please welcome Dr. Mark Garrison. Well, thank you, Joan, for that uh, very generous introduction. I want to thank also Erica for co-sponsoring this, uh, this lecture tonight. Several people here in the Met have been very kind in getting me here, setting me up, and I'd like to mention them, uh, Nicole Leist, Susanna Lee, Molly Kassar, and Fiona Kidd. So my thanks to them for all of their, uh, all of their hospitality. Now, I have been very, very fortunate to work on a corpus of imagery that is without parallel, not only in ancient Iran or indeed in the whole of the ancient Near East, but indeed I would say perhaps in the whole of the ancient world. And these are the seals that are preserved as impressions on these archives that, uh, that Joan mentioned. My primary goal here tonight is to try to give you a glimpse into this unbelievable visual resource by attempting to tackle some problems that have plagued accumulated studies for, for many years now. Now, this lecture cannot talk about all of these things temples, towers. I mean, any one of these topics could well exceed. Uh, the limit that we have here tonight. So really what I want to try to do is just highlight some of these issues by looking at them through the lens of this material unpublished still from the fortification uh, archive. The question of temples in ancient Achaemenid Iran is uh, one that is much debated. Um, there are these famous towers at, uh, at Nakshirustam and Pasargadeh that we'll be looking at as well. There are altars that are uh, depicted in accumulated art, particularly at the site of Nakshirustam that we'll sort of be looking at first as a way of launching into the topic. Um, we'll be trying to tackle a little bit the issue of what role, if any, that fire worship played in accumulated Iran. And in the background, something that we are constantly having to kind of bump up against and deal with is what in Achaemenid studies has been called the Zoroastrian question. And this is a complicated, multifaceted question that again, would, we could spend tonight, the whole of tonight, just kind of trying to deal with that, but we're not going to deal with that. Although you will be aware that we'll have to bump up against it from time to time. Now, of course, just a little bit of background here. The Achaemenid Persian Empire was a vastly complicated and very, very large phenomenon that stretched from the eastern Mediterranean all the way to the Indus River. It was the largest empire that the world had ever seen and certainly um, uh, was equal to that of Alexander and later in the Roman, uh, Roman period. The Achaemenid Persian Empire has its origins in an earlier state founded by Cyrus, sometimes known as Cyrus the Great. And Cyrus's uh, state itself had its origin in two earlier empires of the first millennium, that in Babylonia and then the still earlier one in, uh, in Assyria. In 522, this, this state that Cyrus had created was racked by internal struggles. And the end result is that Darius I comes to power and he rules into the 5th century. The material that we're going to be looking at tonight comes from the reign of Darius. And we're not going to deal with all the very complicated issues surrounding Darius's rise to power. We'll just take it as a fact that he, uh, uh, that, that he is the first Achaemenid king. Now, we don't have to deal with the Achaemenid Empire and all of its complexity tonight. We are going to focus in what we call the heartland of the empire, which is down here in southwestern Iran in this box that I've highlighted for you here. And you see the sites of Susa, Pasargadeh, and Persepolis. Here now is a finer resolution of, uh, of this area. And I've highlighted here the uh, site of Susa, 
the traditional lowland uh, capital of the area that we call ancient uh, Elam. And then in the highlands uh, is another uh, Elamite culture from which the Achaemenid Persians emerge out of. And you see there a series of sites, Persepolis and Nakhchivarstan, which will be our focus tonight, but also just to the north, the imperial capital of Cyrus at, uh, at Pasargadae. Here now is uh, the eastern end of what's known as the Marvdash uh, uh, area. Uh, and there is the platform of Persepolis on the lower uh, circle there. And then the site of Nakhchivarstan, which we started our lecture with. And I could overhear many of you looking at that and say, well, that doesn't look like Persepolis. And in fact, you're right. It's not Persepolis. It's Nakhchivarstan. But I consider Nakhchivarstan a suburb of Persepolis. I mean, we're really looking at only six kilometers between Persepolis and Nakhchivarstan. And this axis between the two sites is littered uh, with remains uh, concerning the Achaemenid period. So this was a very active zone here. And I incorporate Nakhchivarstan into Persepolis in my kind of thinking about it. An old view from the uh, Oriel Institute publications uh, area of the platform at Persepolis. And I'm going to try and use this fancy pen now. If you follow this road out straight, you will run into Nakhchivarstan. You can't actually see Nakhchivarstan from, uh, uh, from Persepolis. Now, I was warned that this may happen. That <laughs> so I was told to hit this. OK, good. There we go. That's what happens when you try to do something you've never done before. This is an aerial view of Nakhchivarstan. Uh, it's an interesting, complicated, and very poorly understood site. You can see that there is a mound. And emerging up out of the mound is this thing right here. Yeah, now you see, now I have to do this again. All right, I was told this could go away automatically. Maybe I'll just stop with the fancy thing there. Um, that's one of the towers that we'll be talking about tonight. And then you can see there are some rock cut reliefs in the face of the cliff. You probably can't make this out very well, but these are identified for you. There, in fact, are four Achaemenid uh, kings that are buried here. And then uh, these other. Uh, areas that you see are in fact Sasanian inscriptions. So I'm just going to check off the areas where the Achaemenid, there's one over, uh, over here and another one here. We're going to be focusing on the tomb of Darius, which is that one right, uh, right there. All right. This now just to give you a little higher resolution where you can see the famous tower. It's in fact taller than what you see on the left hand side because the mound has risen up over it and then the tomb of, uh, uh, of Darius. The tomb of Darius, like so much of the material culture and visual imagery from his period, sets the standards for the Achaemenid for the next 200 years of Achaemenid art. And all later Achaemenid kings basically copied the format that Darius set for his tomb. And I want to start here because anyone who wants to talk about religious ritual in the Achaemenid period will generally start at the tomb relief of Darius at Nakhchivarstan. You can see that, in fact, it's a rather complicated thing uh, consisting of, th of three zones. The middle zone is an architectural facade, and there's a door right in the middle that leads into the rock-cut tomb. And above is a figural relief that will be the focus of our discussion, uh, part of our discussion tonight. And you see, again, it's a very complicated thing. Basically, you see the personifications of the lands of the empire. Uh, they are magically holding aloft this very elaborate platform on which Darius on the left stands. And the focus of his attention are a figure in a winged disc, which we're not going to talk about tonight, uh, a uh, so-called fire altar that we'll be looking at. And there's also over here in this zone that you can't see a uh, crescent inscribed in a disc. Um, it is very difficult to see in most, published, uh, uh, in most published photographs. There are also these projecting wings that come out from the tomb relief. And you can see that there are, figural, there are figures that stand on them. They very seldom does anyone talk about these things, uh, but we'll try and uh, see if we can understand them a little bit better. Here now is this central scene with Darius standing in this very formal way between these uh, entities. We are going to focus uh, uh, tonight on this structure here. Uh, this structure is traditionally identified as a fire altar. Now, why, you might ask, would this be called a fire altar? 
you can see at Nankirustam there, in fact, is an inscription behind Darius on the, to the left. And there's also an inscription in that middle register as well. In, that inscri in those inscriptions at Nankirustam, as well as the very famous inscription at Bisitun, Darius uh, repeatedly invokes the god Ahura Mazda. Because of that, and because also, periodically in those, in those inscriptions, he sort of sets up this dichotomy between the truth and the lie. This has led generations of scholars since the translation of these texts to assume that uh, the Achaemenid Persians were Zoroastrians. And here is where we have to bump up for a little bit to the so-called Zoroastrian question. Ara Mazda is the Avestan name of the primary god of Zoroastrianism, which is, of course, is still an active religion uh, today. Now, the Avesta itself is a very, very complicated compilation of, uh, of text written in a language that we call the Avestan. Right? So the Avesta is written in the Avestan. And it is basically the sacred book for, Zo uh, for Zoroastrian, for contemporary and, and earlier Zoroastrians. Now, we know in the Sasanian period, basically contemporary with the late Roman Empire, that Zoroastrianism was an official religion. I don't want to say the state religion because it probably wasn't the state religion, but it was one of the official religions of the, uh, of the, Sasanian, uh, of the Sasanian period. So we've got Sasanians whom we know are worshiping something that we could potentially recognize as Zoroastrianism. But we don't actually have, we have very, very little material evidence to document the nature of that Zoroastrianism at the time of the Sasanians. In fact, the great bulk of our liter literary evidence for, uh, uh, for this Zoroastrian question is medieval in date. So you see, we have a problem of how do we understand the use of this term Ahura Mazda in the Achaemenid period in the 6th century? Is it valid for us to bring these medieval texts to bear onto that particular question? And this has consumed generations and books have been written trying to figure out exactly how all of this works. And John Kellens, I think, has really, if I were to turn to one person to try to make my way through the tangle of data that we have, I think he can reduce it down for us to a few simple questions. What exactly is the relationship of the Achaemenids to the Avesta? That's something we have to try to figure out, not tonight, thank goodness. And he also makes a very important point. No known Achaemenid document makes a direct citation of a known Avestan text. Now, for me, that's very important in sort of starting any kind of discussion about this particular question. And I really think that he's got it right. In the final analysis, what we are going to have to do at some point is to figure out where the Achaemenid fit in a dynamic development of what we can call Mazda worship. And to assume that these medieval texts can just directly reflect back on the Achaemenid experience, I think, is, uh, is going to cause some difficulties. So that's a little bit of the background on why, traditionally, we would interpret the tomb of Darius' facade from what we can call a Zoroastrian perspective. And perhaps no author encompasses this better than Mary Boyce, whose magisterial survey of the history of Zoroastrian tackles this problem, uh, uh, that is, the Achaemenids' relationship to Zoroastrian. And she, of course, saw the Achaemenids as basically contemporary, almost, Zoroastrian worshipers. And I won't quote for you everything she says about the tomb relief. I've just highlighted a little bit at the last part. The Zoroastrian implications of the tomb sculpture, that's what we're looking at here, are made explicit by the fact that the king stands before a fire holder. Now, uh, by fire holder, what she means is this object here that we're looking at on the relief. This tomb relief, she says, is the earliest known representation of the fire holder with burning fire, which was, which was to be the most generally used Zoroastrian symbol down the ages, down the ages. 
To pray before an elevated fire may be assumed to have been a rite particular to a Zoroastrian king. And so by this carving, Darius was making a strong visual affirmation of his faith. Well, there's not much more one can say at that point. I mean, she is definitive on what we are looking at here. Of course, embedded in this is a circular argument, right? What is this? Oh, well, this is Darius worshiping fire. Why is, would he be worshiping fire? Because he's uh, a Zoroastrian. Well, how is he a Zoroastrian? Well, he's worshiping fire. I mean, you see the, uh, uh, and a lot of, a lot of people get caught in this vicious circle of referencing one back to a, uh, uh, one back to another. So, um, what what Boyce meant by fire holders is got, is what most people call a fire altar, which only confuses the problem even more, because what most people mean when they say a fire altar within the context of Achaemenid Iran is not an altar in the traditional sense of a word of a fire that you pour a libation into or you burn animal as a way of, uh, uh, of sacrifice. But rather what people mean by a fire altar is that it is a thing that holds fire for the worship of fire, not to place anything into it to burn, and that it indicates in particular Zoroastrian fire uh, fire worship. Now, let's see what our new material from Persepolis can bring to this question. It's not going to answer all of these very difficult questions, but I think it can provide some pretty interesting and exciting perspectives that will allow us to kind of move a little bit away from this rigid Zoroastrian perspective to open up other avenues of exploration. Uh, that's an aerial view, obviously, of uh, Persepolis. Two important archives of administrative tablets were found in the Oriental Institute excavations at Persepolis in the 1930s. I've highlighted their find spots for you here. The one up on the north was found in the fortification wall, and it's called the Fortification Archive. It doesn't have anything to do with forts. It's just the place where it was found. And then the second is the Treasury Archive. It was found in the Treasury Building, so there's actually sort of a relationship uh, 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 there. The Treasury Archive uh, has been published for 50 years now and people pretty much know a lot about it. The Fortification Archive is still relatively an unknown phenomenon. What we're going to be looking at tonight are the seals that are impressed on the tablets that come from that archive. So we're going to be focusing main or exclusively on this material from the Fortification Archive. And so I want to give you a little bit of background, just a couple of minutes background this archive because it is a remarkable resource. I mean, it, this is something that an ancient art historian, if they could in their mind dream up the perfect set of circumstances for their material, this is it. This is one of the few photographs taken as they were excavating the fortification uh, uh, archive, and you can see the clay tablets there. Now, as an archive, it's kind of dry and boring. It talks about the collection, taxation, storage, and transport of commodities in the area of Persepolis and extending up to the northwest towards Susa. And then those commodities are doled out as rations to a whole lot of different people, deities, members of the nobility, officials, travelers on the royal road, workers, and, uh, and animals. And I put up here an important book by Walter Hinkelman, published in 2008 that talks about the religious texts, the texts that deal with religious ritual from the, uh, 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 from the archive. It's a, just a sort of milestone publication with this uh, material. So um, what does the archive consist of? Well, first there are clay documents that are written in Elamite. We call it Achaemenid Elamite, to distinguish it from earlier forms of Elamite, because it's a really, really weird form of Elamite uh, that we won't go into tonight. Uh, and uh, they carry, about 90% of these tablets carry seal impressions, and that's what you see coming across the bottom of the, uh, uh, of the thing, and it's these seal impressions that we're going to be looking at, uh, uh, looking at tonight. There are probably 12 to 15,000 of these Elamite texts. 12 to 15,000. Then there are texts that are written in ink, uh, in Aramaic, sometimes they're actually carved in, in Aramaic. Uh, there are about 700 of these, and these all carry seal impressions. About 90% of the Elamite tablets carry seal impressions. And then there are these very interesting but uh, not well understood documents that, are, that carry no text at all, only seal impressions. 
Uh, and of course, to a glyptic specialist, and when we say glyptic, we mean uh, people who are interested in cylinder and stamp seals. Uh, to a glyptic specialist, this is like unbelievable, a, a document that exists for the primary purpose of putting seals on it. Uh, that's pretty interesting uh, 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 phenomenon. And there are maybe 5,000 of, of these. So we're looking at an archive that is somewhere in the area of close to 20,000 documents. That's just the detail of the un one of the uninscribed. Now, these document types relate to each other, and I don't, I'm not going to bore you with exactly how they relate to, uh, uh, to each other, but they're all part of an administrative apparatus, and information is being conveyed in a lot of different ways. But the thing that pulls the whole of this archive together, all 20,000 or so of these documents, are the seal impressions because the seal impressions occur on all three document types and we have overlap like there'll be a there's a there are a number of seals that occur on the Aramaic that also occur on the Elamite and then there are maybe now 50 that occur on all three document uh, document types the thing that I am most interested in are the seals that are applied onto the uh, onto the tablets this is an accounting document and you see that there are two seals that are applied uh, that are applied on it they are remarkably, even though they're small, they're remarkably vivid uh, visual artifacts. And of course, seals or glyptic uh, are a traditional form of uh, visual communication in the ancient Near East that goes back thousands of years. And in many ways, the fortifica fortification archive, the glyptic from it, is like a, a summary of the previous 3,000 years of glyptic, uh, 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 of glyptic, glyptic art. Now, uh, we don't have the actual seals that were applied to the tablet. This is an Akkadian seal, and I show it only so that you can kind of get this connection between the seal and then the impression of the seal. This is the object in its active state. The seal, the, the actual seal itself uh, rolls across there, and then this image leaps up, uh, 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 leaps up at you. We do not have any of the seals from this archive. All we have are the impressions of the seals on these various document, uh, uh, various document types. Now, of course, seals and sealing are uh, an old, and as I say, thou for thousands of years, they are a, a major vehicle of uh, visual carrying, a major vehicle that carries visual imagery in the ancient Near East. And uh, for instance, an early dynastic uh, uh, inlay, and you can see the seal um, the figure is wearing the seal. So this is one of the ways, this is the seal here. This is one of the ways that, um, that seals operated. Uh, and then here you can see on the right-hand side, their active use securing documents uh, in, various sorts of, uh, in various sorts of ways. On these tablets from Persepolis, we have documented close to 3,000 different seals. Now, can you think of another time and another place in the ancient world where we have 3,000 ancient art artifacts that are securely provenanced, not only securely provenanced, but they are being used in, an, in their active way that they were supposed to be used, that is, they are associated with text and tablets, and in many, time, in many cases, those texts provide us information about who's using the seal, what their social or administrative status is. I mean, this is, this is like an art historian's dream to have all of this kind of contextual information in association with uh, images. And not only that, these images come from one of the most critical periods of, ancient, of the ancient Near East. And I'm talking now about the reign of Darius the, the first. So we're talking about 3,000 images that have a known and excavated provenance that are restricted in their usage dates to the early and middle years of the reign of Darius. They are restricted in space to the area of uh, Persepolis and its environs. And they come from the most critical time in the development of Achaemenid Persian art, the reign of Darius I, when all of the, or most of the artistic protocols are established. Again, you couldn't write this any better if you just made it up. Now, this 
go back to our discussion about these uh, uh, about these fire and fire altars and uh, uh, various sorts of things. This has been an issue that has been very uh, that has a long scholarly tradition behind it. And in 1991, there was the last kind of attempt to gather together all of the known representations of uh, of fire altars, so-called fire altars from the Achaemenid uh, 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 period. And there were 16 of them. This we're talking about for the whole of the Achaemenid period and from the expanse from Anatolia all the way to the Indus River Valley, 16 total. From the fortification archive, we now have a corpus of imagery dealing with these, with these so-called fire altars. We have 67 from the fortification archive. If you throw in the ones from the treasury archive that we're not going to talk about, then we have 74 uh, a total now. So in other words, from 1991 to today, the amount of data we have to talk about this problem is quad <coughs> almost quadrupled. And again, this is an exceptionally rare thing in the study of ancient art. You just don't normally have this kind of numerical addition to the corpus. All right, let's look at the phenomenon uh, and, um, and try and get started here uh, a little bit in our discussion of the, of the so-called fire, uh, fire altars. This is a line drawing of one of the seals from, uh, from Persepolis. Uh, you can see here that this is a structure that has a two or three-stepped podium, in this case a three-step, and it supports a burning fire. When this type of thing is traditionally encountered in the archaeological literature, it's called a fire altar, meaning a Zoroastrian fire altar. The other kind of altar we have is this one that you see here, or what has traditionally been called a fire altar. It's in the center of this, and it's a rectangular uh, uh, object. It has these insets on it and, uh, and sort of a battlement uh, profile uh, there. It's a sort of a tower-like thing. And uh, it's traditionally been called a fire altar as well. Both of these now, we're only going to be looking at the examples from, uh, from Persepolis. Now, what I'm going to do is just, uh, when you call it a fire altar, it immediately becomes a Zoroastrian object, and then we're, we go into Zoroastrianism. So we have to take a step back, and one of the ways to do that is by just, let's get some more neutral terminology. So I'll call the thing on the left the step structure, and the thing on the right the tower structure as a way to kind of make some headway. Now, I'm not going to burden you with all of the images that we have from Persepolis that deal with this problem. So I've selected out a handful and grouped them together by types. And one of the interesting things is that these, uh, th these, these objects occur in a very restricted kind of iconographical parameter. So they naturally fall into tidy, uh, 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 tidy categories. One category is, uh, we'll, talk, we'll start with the step structure, and one category is scenes where you've got this person who's actively engaged with the, uh, with the, with the fire on the step uh, structure. And you see that in one hand they hold a cup, in another they hold an, uh, some other kind of object. It's really kind of unclear what that object is. A lot of different ideas have been suggested in similar scenes. This is a nice example of it here. Uh, this also reminds me to tell you the line drawings that you see here are compilations often of multiple impressions of a seal. And any one impression, such as you see on this tablet, very often will not capture all of that information. So the line drawings are kind of an aid to be able to see what is actually on the, uh, uh, it's a way to kind of recreate the, uh, uh, recreate the seal. Now, the step structure occurs in another type of scene, uh, and that is associated with animal sacrifice. So here you can see the one on the left. There's the step structure. The upper part of it isn't preserved, but someone's actually getting ready to cut up the animal. And this is probably a similar sort of scene. It's very fragmentary. And I know this is a hard thing to sort of see and understand, but you can see the step, the, the step structure. But I also did want to give you a feel for sometimes the fragmentary nature of this, uh, of this material and how important it is to have to deal with them in this reconstructed line drawings. All right. This step structure then uh, has some characteristic traits. A fire is always shown on it. All right, that's good. If you want a fire altar, you need to fire uh, on it. The scenes always show a readable action. That is, they're this person who's engaging with the uh, fire. Very often there are, uh, there are 
the person holds a vessel up to the fire. As you can see in the scene on the left, there is butchery documented. In other words, it's sacrifice. Right? And so I would say that overall, one of the, some of the primary things about these scenes is that they have a very high narrative quality. We can read them. There's a story behind them. And they appear to be rooted in a real time and a real space. All right, let's turn to this other structure now, which I'm calling the tower structure. And it's a more complicated phenomenon. One, there are more examples of it than there are the step structure. And so always in ancient art, if you've got more of something, things generally get a little bit more complicated. Here are, here's one type of scene that this so-called tower structure occurs in. Uh, and it's a very uh, regular type of scene. You've got these two attendants who are flanking the, uh, uh, the tower structure. Very often you have the figure in the, uh, uh, the finger in the winged disc, and those attendants always hold something. Sometimes it's a staff, sometimes it's a flower. Here is uh, uh, one of the seals from Persepolis here. By the way, you'll see a lot of acronyms that are used, or initialisms that are used to identify seals from Persepolis. I won't burden you with all of that. Uh, just know that these are seals from, uh, uh, seals from Persepolis. This is a, actually a, a quite an elaborate rendering of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this tower structure. Now this cluster of, of images that show this particular type of scene, uh, again, are very consistent. And unlike the scenes that we saw just before, there's never a fire on this structure. Right? And to anticipate what we probably knew already, but we have refused to let go, these do not have anything to do with fire, these tower structures. These scenes also are different in that there's this very calm, static quality to them. The attendants stand back away from the, from the tower structure. They often hold, uh, as I say, the things in their hands. And probably the most striking thing, and potentially something that you recognize, is that these seals look achaemenid, don't they? I mean, the, the, uh, the crown figures are wearing a very distinctive type of garment that we associate with Achaemenid art. That figure in the winged disc uh, also is something that we know. I call this court-centric iconography. Uh, that is, there's a, an overlay of imagery that is associated with the, uh, uh, with the Achaemenid king. And almost all of them are executed in a particular style of carving that we today have come to call the court style. Now, these scenes, in, uh, in opposition to the ones we saw before, are very static. They exhibit what I would call a strong emblematic quality, and they really exist in an unreal time and an unreal space. And this is main, you can see this especially in the doubled figures of the king. Uh, in other words, we have this magical panoptic perspective because the handedness is very carefully observed. And the one figure is simply the other figure turned 180 degrees. So you've got this really interesting kind of cinematic view of the royal, uh, of the royal figure. Now, this tower structure occurs in a lot of other very interesting scenes. One of them is uh, it occurs as the end point of a procession of figures. And so uh, here we can see one. Uh, on your right, where an animal is being led towards the uh, tower structure. Here's another one over here, where the figure has a, some kind of vessel, and you can just make out the forelegs of, uh, of an animal. Now, you'll notice that this tower structure is different from the ones that we saw before. And these tower structures allow a little bit more of, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this down because it seems to be like thumping, doesn't it? Is that bothering you because it's driving me crazy? Can you still hear me? Yeah, okay. Is everybody, can you still hear me here? Okay, good. Um, here are just a selection of ways that this tower structure is, is shown. And you can see it admits a wide variety. One, you'll see the distinctive kind of crenellations or battlements on it. And then you've got this other way of showing it where it's in this kind of V-shaped way. The fact that they're shown in the very same kinds of scenes indicate to me that we're looking at the same kind of, uh, the same kind of phenomenon. And then look at this, uh, uh, this particular one. Here's the tower structure here. Here's an attendant who is holding. All right. That's like driving me crazy.
Can you still hear me? All right, I'm just going to stay here now. <laughs> All right. Um, you can see the attendant who holds some kind of uh, vessel. This guy also, here also is probably holding something, and he's leading an animal toward the, uh, toward the thing. Now, these kinds of scenes where you've got the tower structures and endpoint of a procession, again, they have very rigid what I would call icono, uh, uh, iconological boundaries. They fall into this neat kind of category. A fire is never shown on the tower structure. The scenes show actions. The figures hold vessels and they kill animals. There's only one or two examples that show what we what I would call court-centric iconography. They're never executed in that court style like that fancy seal 11 we were looking at. And overall, the scenes have a very high narrative, uh, very high narrative quality. Another interesting category, don't worry, I'm not going to show you all of the various categories, just the main ones here. Another interesting category is we've got this tower structure with a seated figure and an animal. In fact, this is numerically the most uh, dominant type of scene that we have with this, with this, tower, this tower structure. And you, these are two that are particularly interesting because you can see that the, the body of the tower structure have these elaborate panels on them. And in this particular example here, you see the guy sitting down actually reaches out and holds the animal, grasps the animal, almost like a heroic encounter. And many of these scenes with the tower structure and a seated figure also uh, uh, have a banquet quality. The seated figure will have uh, hold cups, as in this example here. So this particular cluster, I, call, I think of them as kind of syntactical clusters, uh, has this, char this characteristic. A fire is never indicated on the structure. You can see the direction this is going. The tower structure never has a fire on it. Uh, the seated figures are often doing something, reaching towards the structure. They can hold things like batons and, uh, and vessels, and they can actually hold these animals. Now, although these scenes would, on one level, seem to have a high narrative quality, I do not think that, uh, that people sit around holding up animals to one side uh, in front of whatever this structure is. And so these, things, uh, these scenes, in, in fact, I think have a strong emblematic. I mean, this is an unreal space that we are dealing uh, uh, with here. The last cluster that I want to look at is the most spectacular. For the first time, we now have uh, seals from Persepolis that show these two structures, the step structure and the tower structure, on the very same scene. Uh, this is seal 75. You can see these are all processional and they fall into two groups. This particular group here, attendant holds a vessel near the, the uh, step structure and then another attendant leads an animal in. This is just a little detail here so that you can see. Now, I, I guess it goes without saying, but perhaps I should. We've never seen anything like this in Achaemenid Persian art. I mean, this is, uh, this is kind of unknown territory for us. Here's the one that you may have seen on the invitation that was extended to you. Um, a beautifully executed step structure with this blazing fire on it, and then the tower structure, an animal being led to it, an attendant next to the tower structure. This is a spectacular seal. And of course, it brings home again just that oftentimes these seals are what I would call monumental works of art in, in the real meaning of that term. And then look at this one. The animal's throat is actually being slit as another attendant pours something into the fire on the step structure that stands before the tower structure. You couldn't make this up. I mean, really, if those who study Achaemenid art would look at this and say, we've never had anything like this. The other cluster where you have the two uh, uh, together, the tower and the step structure. You don't see them leading animals, but they carry vessels. And you can just make out on the one at the far right, over here, and it's also being documented here, they hold their hand up over their mouth. I've got a better example in this seal. When I found this seal, and, and literally, <laughs> This is kind of, I mean, anecdotal, fun aspect of the study of this material. This stuff has never been studied before. Uh, they're in boxes in Chicago. And so I go to Chicago and I pull stuff out of boxes. It's like Christmas, right? <laughs> and when you find something like this, I mean, it just takes your breath away because we, have, we just do not have any kind of evidence like this for a chemotid ritual. And here we have it, not only 
on these beautiful impressions, but they are tied to this archive in all kinds of interesting social political uh, ways. Many of you will recognize this gesture of the hand over the mouth. It occurs in a uh, committed monumental art as well. This is just another photograph of that same tablet. Those of you who are used to traditional characterizations of Achaemenid art will say, this doesn't look anything like Achaemenid art, and it doesn't. It does not, this, this material looks nothing like what we would traditionally associate with Achaemenid art because the archive is capturing a whole other aspect of the visual culture. All right, these processional scenes that show both of the, uh, uh, both of the structures we're interested in, the tower and the step structure, uh, they confirm for us the step structure holds fire. The tower structure never does. These things, again, are very active. The attendants do stuff. They kill animals. Interestingly, there's no court-centric iconography, no winged discs, no elaborate court robes, none of that kind of stuff. These things then have a very high narrative quality and appear rooted in a real time and space. Now, it's interesting that these scenes that show the two structures together have direct overlaps with the scenes that show only the step structure or only the tower structure. And the overlaps are many. For instance, libations being poured into the fire or attendants who hold vessels in procession and then leading animals towards a structure, this one leading them toward the tower structure, this leading towards the tower and the step structure combined, the sacrificial killing of animals before the step and or tower structure. And indeed, if one were so inclined to be a sort of a literal reading, we can reconstruct a ritual narrative, as it were. Animal led before stepped and tower structure, libation poured into the fire on the step structure, animal killed, and then at the bottom, butchery of the animal. So essentially we have a narrative sequence. Now what's interesting about this narrative sequence that you may have already picked up on is that a deity is never shown, either in figural form or in abstract form. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. All right, so what does all this mean? This means that I think we can understand the syntax of these scenes. In other words, they make sense, they fall into clusters that make sense to us. So just because you understand syntax, of course, doesn't mean that you understand what the thing is saying. And I want to end here to try to tell you what I think these things are saying. And first I'll start at the word level. That is, with the individual objects themselves, the tower structure and the step structure. So we can put together a set of characteristics of the step structure. It always carries a fire. It receives liquid libations. It receives meat, meat sacrifices. Bundles can be shown in some scenes. It's an endpoint of processions. And it stands always in front of the tower structure when you have the two of them together. I think we can say, I, I feel I can say, this is an altar. I mean, this is an altar in the traditional sense of the word, of something that you pour liquid sacrifice into and you put meat sacrifice into as a means of communication with the, with the gods. Now that may seem straightforward to all of us and we're accustomed to that in the study of ancient art. Any of you from a Greco-Roman perspective will readily recognize this. But to say this within the context of Achaemenid Iran is a, is a highly radical thing to say because of the imposition of various aspects of Zoroastrian belief onto our documentation. In fact, the, there are only a couple of times when a deity is depicted or abstractly depicted, and it's this uh, lunar crescent here, traditionally associated with the uh, uh, Assyro-Babylonian moon god Sin, no winged figure in the whole Ahura Mazda question. So the issue of a fire cult in a modern Zoroastrian sense, and that in itself is a difficult thing to say because different modern Zoroastrians think about fire worship in different ways, and et cetera, but we can't get into that today. I would say is at best highly ambiguous, and in some cases we really can't argue it. What about this tower structure? Well, we know it serves as a backdrop for the step structure. It's the focus of adoration in and of itself, isn't it? especially these types of scenes, is what I'm thinking of. 
It never carries a fire. Let me say again, it never carries a fire. It, hence, it cannot be a fire altar or anything that we could call a fire altar. The attendants never directly interact with the structure in the way that the attendants do with the fire on the step structure. Often, the structure itself is the focus of adoration, and in these types of scenes that you're seeing here, they always are densely, densely referenced with royal iconography, what I call court century iconography. That seems to me to signal that we're dealing with a phenomenon, the tower structure, that is not a literal depiction of something that exists in time and space, but that its significance is its ability to carry meaning by association. So that this is a complex sign, and so we might be helpful to kind of think about it in that particular way. Now, you do not want me to bore you with all of the kind of semiotic background, and I won't. I will simply say this. One thing we could think about is, okay, if this is a sign, could it potentially be an iconic sign? And here I borrow the term from the semiotics of Charles Peirce, where in this very, in this very rigid definition, an icon is something in visual image that is meant to imitate something that exists in reality, so that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between what the thing looks like in the visual image and what it looks like in space. If this is what we are dealing with with these structures, then the only thing that exists in space that we know of that still exists are the two famous towers from uh, from Fars. This is the uh, one at Nangxi Rustam. This is the one at Pasargade. The Pasargade one dates earlier. They are exact copies of each other. Oh, I mean, literally down to the measurement, these things are almost exact copies. This one dates to the time of Cyrus. The other one dates to the time of, uh, of Darius. Alas, were we to turn to these structures for some sort of help, we're lost. I mean, we are literally lost in space with these two structures because there's absolutely no evidence, either archaeological or literary, that helps us understand what in blazes these things are. I mean, you just pull your hair out. Here are two of the most important monuments from the heartland of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, and we don't know what they are. So that means we can call them anything, and most people... <laughs> They are fire temples. They are receptacles for Zoroastrian fire. They are foundation houses. Another, here again is the Zoroastrian overlay coming in. They are altars in and of themselves. They are fire altars. They can, they've been called tombs and they've been called coronation towers as well. Uh, so that's not very helpful. The two, they, they are. But anyway, the iconic correspondence between what we're seeing in these seals and these things is very low. And if they are meant to be icon in this very, very narrow definition of the term, well, I think they're failing. Uh, and you don't need me to point out how one is hard-pressed to recognize this phenomenon with this phenomenon. Now, if we open up our investigation and think, okay, this is not an iconic, it's not meant to represent something that actually exists in space, but in fact, it's make-believe, it's fantasy. And of course, this is the power of images, isn't it? Images don't have to be real. Right? One of the ways that images are powerful is that they re can recreate things in space, but another much more powerful aspect of images is that they are imaginary. They don't have to exist in reality. And so if we think of them in an indexical manner, that is, they're pointing to things in the landscape, that opens up some really interesting lines of investigation. For instance, those crenellations and the crenellated tower type that we've seen, they, they occur all over the place at Persepolis. You see them along the balustrade here of the, uh, of the Apadana. Krefter, who was the German architect for Schmidt, loved these things. And all of his reconstructions have crenellations going all over the place. These actually exist. We don't know if those <laughs> exist or, or not. And here's Krefter's famous reconstruction of the entrance of the platform. And you see, there are, there are, pair of, there are these battlement things all over the place. One has to use Krefter with a good deal of, of uh, care. Now, the other major thing about these tower structures is this insistent 
depiction of something on the body, generally this kind of recessing. And of course, recessing is something that you see all over in Achaemenid architecture once you start to look for it. Like this is again the tower at Nakshirustam. Look at how the windows are recessed. They're blank windows, they're fake windows. And they're actually picked out in a different color stone. The parapets themselves, you see, have recesses on them. Persepolis was itself a mud brick city for the most part. Only the door jams, column capitals, column bases were picked out and window frames were picked out in stone. And for that reason, it exhibits the characteristic of mud brick architecture of having recesses here, here, here on the Apadana. Here again, the Apadana. This is Crafter's Reconstruction. I just want to say that all of this is highly... Well, this is one of the places where Crefter got maybe a little bit carried away. I'm talking about the recesses. There's no actual, ar these are the doorways here. Once you get started with this thing, it's hard to stop. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and of course, the entrance to the tomb of Nakshirustam has a recessed doorway as, uh, as well. You remember that there's this other kind of tower structure, the one that has these uh, kind of blank V-shaped sorts of things. Um, can they fit into this somehow? Uh, well, you know, maybe we can just say, oh, well, they're just bad representations of those crenellations that we saw previously. But this is insistent. I mean, we've got many, many examples that, that show this. And again, as you begin to look through Persepolitan architecture, and I include Nakshirustam in that, here's again the tower at Nakshirustam. I'm focusing in on the doorway. Look at the way the, the doorway is treated. You've got these things that kind of come up in a U-shape above the door. And then what's below the door? There's a recess. So essentially, we have all the elements in the doorway at Nakshirustam. Uh, we have all the elements shown on the, on the so-called tower structure. Now, uh, a lot of people, when I've uh, talked about these things, they say, ah, those look like horns, don't they? And I thought, well, that's kind of a crazy idea. But no, I mean, horns, in fact, that's a great idea because we know that in Elam, immediately preceding the Achaemenid period, horns were copiously depicted on Elamite religious sanctuaries. This is a very, very famous line drawing of one of the release slabs from Ashurbanipal's palace at Nineveh. And can you see up here? There are the horns at the top of the ziggurat. This is actually the temple, and this is the ziggurat here. And, of course, there's a famous passage in Ashurbanipal's campaign where he sacks Susa, and he says, I destroyed the ziggurat with its golden horns. And then they said, well, you know, Persepolis has a lot of horns on the architecture as well. I mean, what's the most famous? When people think of Persepolis architecturally, what they think about, probably what they know most, are these famous composite capitals that are bullhead protomes with horns. There's one up in the gallery. And in the course of excavations right before the Iranian Revolution, an Italian team actually found some parapets that are horns. This is their reconstruction of what that parapet would have looked like. It was only on the southeastern corner, apparently, and no one knows the dates of these things either. Now, you remember there's this other tower at Pasargade, the Zendan, and um, it is in very poor state of preservation, and Stronach, in this reconstruction, basically borrowed the, uh, the tower at Nakshirustam. But what he had were fragments of uh, stone that he thought came from the doorway of the tower at Pasargade. And you'll remember that one other way that the tower structures are uh, decorated is in these uh, kind of medical fields, and that's exactly what Stronach thought the tower at Pasargade, how the doorway would have, uh, would have looked. Well, good heavens. I mean, we're all over the map here, aren't we? I mean, we've got parapets, we've got doorways, we've got horn column capitals. That's why I think that potentially really what we ought to be thinking about is a more generalized reference in this structure that I'm calling the tower structure. And that more generalized reference, an indexical reference, is to basically royal architecture as a constructed unit. 
right? Now we know, of course, one of the things that any ancient Near Eastern king did was he built. And he was very proud of that building, and it became a central focus of the ideology of all Mesopotamian kings. That building very often is invested with religious authority, so that the broader semantics of this structure, if it is a generalized reference to architecture, legitimate kingship, accumulated pa the king's patronage and uh, pa uh, prestige, Revival establishment of empire, which we know Darius was very interested in, the welfare of the empire. So that now we've moved in kind of these emblematic associations, right? And of course, we are moving into the religious and associations with the, uh, with the divine, potentially in some cases linked with fire. Doorways seem really important. And again, I come back to the long tradition in the art of Mesopotamia of condensing the temple facade to a doorway or a gateway. Well, what does all of this have to do, how, how does this help us when we come back and we'll end now here at Nanchi Rustam? One of the things that this material has at least uh, helps me is to broaden my understanding or my, at least my thinking about this very famous tumor leaf of Darius at Nakhchi Rustam. Now obviously we've got some direct overlaps with this glyptic material. First of all, the form of the structure at Nakhchi Rustam is exactly the same or except it is a little bit different but is basically one of these stepped podia that we saw, uh, for instance, on the left and of course it always has fire on it. The Problem, not problem, but the interesting aspect of the scene at Nakhchi Rustam is that it's very static. It's exceptionally static, whereas all of the scenes with the with the uh, with the so-called step structure are active. The royal figure isn't engaged with the fire. In fact, he stands back from it. And of course, we've got this dense overlay of court-centric iconography at Nakhchi Rustam. And in fact, Nakhchi Rustam looks more like this, doesn't it? this scene with the tower uh, structure here, where the king stands back away from the structure and um, doesn't actively engage with it, and you've got this kind of timeless uh, quality to it. What's also interesting is that the, the glyptic make us bring the attendants back into the main scene at Nakhsa Rustam. Now, the attendants almost always drop out of any description. The, the people just aren't interested in those attendants. And in this photograph, they aren't, you can't even see them. They're in the shadow over here. And so on the left-hand side are the attendants from one of the other tombs at Nakhchi Rustam, which are exactly similar to what you would see in Darius's tomb. And what do you recognize about those attendants? They assume the very same pose, the ones over here, on, the, on, on our right, they assume the very same pose that we see in these processional, uh, in these processional scenes. And you remember on that wing on the right-hand side, they also, you see the attendant has his hand up over his, his mouth. So what these seal, what this imagery from the archive allows us to do in many ways to bridge Nakhchi Rustam, to make Nakhchi Rustam come to life. One of the weird things about Nakhchi Rustam is it's never really been excavated after Schmidt was there in the 1930s, and he worked there for two weeks. He only worked at Nakhchi Rustam for two weeks. All he did was clear the tower, which is still when you go today, you see the hole he dug around the tower, and he dug away so that you could see the Sasanian reliefs. But these seals, I think, or at least for me, they help me bridge Nakhchi Rustam. They help me understand Nakhchi Rustam better. We've got the, the, we've got the step structure with the fire on it in the seal and on the relief. We've got the attendants with their hands over their mouth or in the case of Nakhchi Rustam also uh, who are just standing holding uh, spears. And then on the glyptic we've got the architectural reference but of course you don't need that at Nakhchi Rustam because it's there in reality in the form of the tower. So that, in a sense, then, the relief of Darius at Nakhchi Rustam has as its backdrop the actual architectural facade, or the generalized, in this case, it's not a generalized reference, it is the tower at Nakhchi Rustam. 
I don't know if you can see this. This is probably a silly thing to do, isn't it? I've laid over that image of CL91 from the archive uh, and took away the background so that, I mean, uh, we've, there's this bridge. In other words, to understand the relief at Nox Rustam, we must pull in the tower, and it is part of this processional ritual. But of course, Nox Rustam is not anything like what we see in the glyptic, nor would we expect it. Nox Rustam is the official statement that marks the restructuring of a whole lot of things in Achaemenid society, which includes visual representation of the, uh, of the king. What I would suggest to you is that what we're seeing is a very sophisticated attempt at Nox Rustam to blend these two traditions. The narrative tradition, something's happening. But at Nox Rustam, that narrative has been pushed to the edges where the processional figures are. So we're much more in the space of the uh, tower structure such as we see there. But to blend that narrative with this emblematic, timeless, and I would argue numinous aspect so that now the king stands back, is isolated, and we are frozen in time and space. And I need not say that this conjunction of the emblematic and the narrative is one of the defining characteristics of the most important royal monuments of ancient Western Asia. This is, of course, the famous Naram Sin stele, where Naram Sin stands in a realistic landscape, and yet he's magnified and he's divine. So you've got this narrative battle taking place, but within it, this emblem of the divine king. And what I would suggest to you is that Darius is uh, essentially trying to do the, the same sort of thing. And how is he trying to do that? Well, of course, Darius, as many Near Eastern monarchs, had issues of legitimacy. This goes back to the events I mentioned to you for 522. And obviously, one aspect of the uh, whole program of Darius is to express his legitimacy. And, you know, well, yeah, okay, uh, we get that. That's what kings do, right? They express their legitimacy and power. That's not so interesting. What's interesting is the way that they do it. And what Darius is doing is he's, what I'm saying, I think he's re-imaging the ritual landscape by inserting himself into these scenes and then reformulating the visual formulae to focus upon him so that Nakshi Rustam has its origins in these processional scenes coming before the tower structure and the step structure, but that's all been pushed to the side. A stage curtain has opened up, and now we have the king inserted as the central defining focus of this. And this, of course, articulates the new social political system that underlies a new order. And uh, that, of course, was one of Darius's principal objectives and is another lecture. Thank you so much for your patience. I appreciate it. <laughs>